the crook in the lot, or a display of the sovereignty and wisdom of God in the afflictions of men and the Christian's deportment under them. By Rev. Thomas Boston. Preface Thomas Boston, the author of The Crook in the Lot, was born in the town of Dunce, Scotland, A.D. 1676, of respectable and religious parentage, and was the youngest of seven children. He was licensed to preach the gospel in 1697, and was ordained at Simprin in 1699. In the year 1700 he married Catherine Brown, a lady of good family and rare endowments of mind. By her he had a number of children, four of whom survived him. He departed this life in the hope of a glorious immortality, A.D. 1732, in the fifty-sixth year of his age. In person Mr. Boston was above the middle stature, and of a grave and amiable aspect. His mind was vigorous and fruitful, his imagination lively but under due restraint, his judgment solid, his affections warm and tender, and his whole demeanor courteous, obliging, and benevolent. Under provocation he was gentle and always manifested a delicate regard for the feelings of others. But when a just occasion of rebuke occurred, he was always prompt in administering it. Having become in early life a subject of divine grace, he honored his profession by a deportment at once consistent and uniform. He was preeminently a man of prayer, cultivating a close communion with God, and receiving many encouraging evidences of his personal acceptance. The divine providence was carefully observed and recorded by him in all its operations, and the law of God was regarded in all its claims with the most scrupulous exactness, tender in conscience, watchful in spirit, and rich in Christian experience. His effort was to avoid even the appearance of evil, and to be fruitful in every good work. In regard to others, he was affectionate as a husband, indulgent as a father, and sincere and faithful as a friend. Not only did he extend his counsel and sympathy to the distressed, but one-tenth of his annual income was religiously devoted to the relief of the poor. As a scholar, Mr. Boston was well versed in the Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and French languages, and in other departments of learning was no novice. As a theologian, his various works afford the best evidence of his great acquirements, of his sound and judicious views, and of his skill in defending the truth. In his application to study, he was indefatigable, and it was with him a rule to leave no subject he was investigating until he had mastered its difficulties. Yet withal he was so unostentatious that nothing in his manner betrayed the conceit of learning. He was a liberal admirer of the gifts of others, and was unwilling to detract from their merits, although they might differ with him in opinion. As a minister of Jesus Christ he was particularly conspicuous. He was mighty in the Scriptures not only in his critical acquaintance with them, but in his understanding of their spirit and power, by which he was well qualified to expound in a clear, simple, and cogent manner the great mysteries of the gospel to others. His thoughts were generally just and often profound, his mode of expression simple and yet forcible, his imagination fertile and happily adapted illustrations, his delivery graceful and earnest, and in his whole manner in the pulpit gravity, meekness, and authority were happily blended. His ministrations were not only acceptable, but successful in the conversion of sinners and in the edification of saints. Mr. Boston, although a devoted student, never suffered his delightful pursuit of knowledge to interfere with his pastoral visitations. In preparing for the pulpit, he generally wrote out his sermons in full, an example worthy of imitation by more modern preachers. It is a remarkable fact that, although Mr. Boston was so eminently endowed by grace and mental culture for the work of the ministry, yet he was tempted to abandon it after he had entered on it, from a deep and humbling sense of his unfitness for the work. This was indeed a rare humility. In ecclesiastical judicatories Mr. Boston displayed great wisdom and prudence, and was well qualified to give counsel in difficult and intricate cases. His talent was so admirable in framing minutes, that he was pronounced by a statesman of considerable note, the best clerk he had ever known in any court, civil or ecclesiastical. In relation to the general concerns of the Church, zeal and knowledge were happily combined in him, and in securing its best interests few were so zealous for its purity 
were studious of its peace. He was no friend to innovations, and always subjected novel suggestions to the most careful scrutiny. His opinion on the subject of controversy was that error was best confuted by a strong representation of the truth, and in his defense of the Protestant doctrine against the aspersions of a certain book, he fully vindicated the truth, answering objections, but still avoided all offensive personal allusions. In some notices of his life written for the use of his children, he remarks, Thus also I was much addicted to peace, and averse from controversy, though once engaged therein, I was set to go through with it. I had no great difficulty to retain a due honor and charity for my brethren, differing from me both in opinion and practice. But then I was no great hazard, neither of being swayed by them to depart from what I judged truth or duty. Withal it was easy to me to yield to them in things wherein I found not myself in conscience bound up. Whatever precipitant steps I have made in the course of my life, which I desire to be humbled for, rashness in conduct was not my weak side. But since the Lord, by His grace, brought me to consider things, it was much my exercise to discern sin and duty in particular cases, being afraid to venture on things, until I should see myself called thereto. But when the matter was cleared to me, I generally stuck fast by it, being as much afraid to desert the way which I took to be pointed out to me. The same paper he thus concludes, And thus I have given some account of the days of my vanity. Upon the whole, I bless my God in Jesus Christ, that ever he made me a Christian, and took an early dealing with my soul, that ever he made me a minister of the gospel, and gave me some insight into the doctrine of his grace, and that ever he gave me the blessed Bible, and brought me acquainted with the originals, and especially with the Hebrew text. The world hath all along been a step-dame unto me, and whenever I would have attempted to nestle in it, there was a thorn of uneasiness laid for me. Man is born crying, lives complaining, and dies disappointed from that quarter. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. It may be interesting for the reader to know that the truly valuable treatise with which he is here presented, under a quaint title, was one of the last of the author's writings, and therefore embodies much of the maturity of his experience. He was engaged in revising it when he was called to cease from his labors. May it prove a happy legacy to every one into whose hands it may fall. Ecclesiastes 7.13 Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? A just view of afflicting incidents is altogether necessary to a Christian deportment under them, and that view is to be obtained only by faith, not by sense. For it is the light of the word alone that represents them justly, discovering in them the work of God, and consequently designs becoming the divine perfections. When these are perceived by the eye of faith, and duly considered, we have a just view of afflicting incidents, fitted to quell the turbulent motions of corrupt affections under dismal outward appearances. It is under this view that Solomon, in the preceding part of this chapter, advances several paradoxes which are surprising determinations in favor of certain things, that to the eye of sense, looking gloomy and hideous, are therefore generally reputed grievous and shocking. He pronounceth the day of one's death to be better than the day of his birth, namely, the day of the death of one who, having become the friend of God through faith, hath led a life to the honor of God and service of his generation, and thereby raised himself the good and savory name better than precious ointment. Verse 1. In like manner, he pronounces the house of mourning to be preferable to the house of feasting, sorrow to laughter, and a wise man's rebuke to a fool's song. For that, howbeit the latter, are indeed the more pleasant, yet the former are the more profitable. Verses 2 through 6. And observing with concern how men are in hazard, not only from the world's frowns and ill usage, oppression making a wise man mad, but also from its smiles and caresses, a gift destroying the heart. Therefore, since whatever way it goes there is danger, he pronounces the end of every worldly thing better than the beginning thereof. Verses 7. 8. And from the whole, 
he justly infers that it is better to be humble and patient than proud and impatient under afflicting dispensations, since, in the former case, we wisely submit to what is really best, in the latter we fight against it. Verse 8. And he dissuades from being angry with our lot because of the adversity found therein. Verse 9. Cautions against making odious comparisons of former and present times, in that point insinuating undue reflections on the providence of God. Verse 10. And against that curious and fretful disposition, he first prescribes a general remedy, namely, holy wisdom, as that which enables us to make the best of every thing, and even giveth life in killing circumstances. Verses 11, 12. And then a particular remedy, consisting in a due application of that wisdom towards taking a just view of the case. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In which words are proposed, one, the remedy itself, two, the suitableness thereof. One, the remedy itself is a wise eyeing of the hand of God in all we find to bear hard upon us. Consider the work, or see thou the doing, of God. Namely, in the crooked, rough, and disagreeable parts of thy lot, the crosses thou findest in it. Thou seest very well the cross itself, yea, thou turnest it over and over in thy mind, and leisurely viewest it on all sides. Thou lookest withal to this and the other second cause of it, and so thou art in a foam and fret. But, wouldst thou be quieted and satisfied in the matter, lift up thine eyes towards heaven, See the doing of God in it, the operation of His hand. Look at that, and consider it well. I, the first cause of the crook in thy lot, behold how it is the work of God, His doing. 2. This view of the crook in our lot is very suitable to still indecent risings of heart, and quiet us under it. For who can, that is, none can, make that straight which God hath made crooked? As to the crook in thy lot, God hath made it, and it must continue while he will have it so. Shouldst thou ply thine utmost force to even it, or to make it straight, thine attempt will be vain. It will not alter for all thou canst do. Only he who made it can mend it, or make it straight. This consideration, this view of the matter, is a proper means at once to silence and to satisfy men and so to bring them unto a dutiful submission to their Maker and Governor, under the crook in their lot. Now we take up the purpose of the text in these three propositions. Proposition 1. Whatsoever crook there is in one's lot, it is of God's making. Proposition 2. What God sees meet to mar, no one shall be able to mend in his lot. Proposition 3. The considering of the crook in the lot as the work of God or of his making is a proper means to bring us to a Christian deportment under it. Proposition 1. Whatsoever crook there is in one's lot, it is of God's making. Here two things are to be considered, namely the crook itself and God's making of it. 1. As to the crook itself, the crook in the lot, for the better understanding thereof these few things that follow are premised. 1. There is a certain train or course of events by the providence of God falling to every one of us during our life in this world, and that is our lot, as being allotted to us by the sovereign God, our Creator and Governor, in whose hand our breath is, and whose are all our ways. This train of events is widely different to different persons, according to the will and pleasure of the sovereign manager, who ordereth men's conditions in the world in a great variety, some moving in a higher, some in a lower sphere. 2. In that train or course of events, some fall out cross to us, and against the grain, these make the crook in our lot. While we are here, there will be cross events as well as agreeable ones in our lot and condition. Sometimes things are softly and agreeably gliding on, but by and by there is some incident which alters that course, grates us and pains us, as when we have made a wrong step and we begin to halt. 3. Everybody's lot in this world hath some crook in it. Complainers are apt to make odious comparisons. They look about, and taking a distant view of the condition of others, can discern nothing in it but what is straight, and just to one's wish. 
so they pronounce their neighbor's lot wholly straight. But that is a false verdict. There is no perfection here, no lot out of heaven without a crook. For, as to all the works that are done under the sun, behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. Ecclesiastes 1, 14, 15. Who would not have thought that Haman's lot was very straight, while his family was in a flourishing condition, and he prospering in riches and honor, being prime minister of state in the Persian court, and standing high in the king's favor? Yet there was, at the same time, a crook in his lot which so galled him that all this availed him nothing. Esther 5.13 Everyone feels for himself where he is pinched, though others perceive it not. Nobody's lot in this world is wholly crooked. There are always some straight and even parts in it. Indeed, when men's passions, having gotten up, have cast a mist over their minds, they are ready to say, All is wrong with them, nothing right. But though in hell that tale is true, and ever will be so, yet it is never true in this world. For there, indeed, there is not a drop of comfort allowed. Luke 16, 24, 25. But here it always holds good that it is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Lamentations 3. 22. 4. The crook and the lot came into the world by sin. It is owing to the fall. Romans 5.12. By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, under which death the crook and the lot is comprehended, as a state of comfort or prosperity is, in scripture style, expressed by living. 1 Samuel 25.6. John 4.50.51. Sin so bowed the hearts and minds of men that they became crooked in respect of the holy law, and God justly so bowed their lot that it became crooked too. And this crook in our lot inseparably follows our sinful condition, till, dropping this body of sin and death, we get within heaven's gates. These being premised to crook in the lot speaks in general two things. 1. Adversity. 2. Continuance. Accordingly, it makes a day of adversity opposed to the day of prosperity in the verse immediately following the text. The crook in the lot is, first, some one or other piece of adversity. The prosperous part of one's lot, which goes forward according to one's wish, is the straight and even part of it. The adverse part, going a contrary way, is the crooked part thereof. God hath intermixed these two in men's condition in this world, that, as there is some prosperity therein, making the straight line, so there is also some adversity, making the crooked, which mixture hath place not only in the lot of saints, who are told that in the world they shall have tribulation, but even in the lot of all, as already observed. Secondly, it is adversity of some continuance. We do not reckon it a crooked thing, which, though forcibly bended and bowed together, yet presently recovers its former straightness. There are twinges of the rod of adversity, which, passing like a stitch in one side, all is immediately set to rights again. One's lot may be suddenly overclouded, but the cloud vanish ere he is aware. But under the crook, one having leisure to find his smart, is in some concern to get the crook made even. So the crook in the lot is adversity, continued for a shorter or longer time. Now there is a threefold crook in the lot incident to the children of men. One one made by a cross dispensation, which howsoever in itself passing, yet hath lasting effects. Such a crook did Herod's cruelty make in the lot of the mothers in Bethlehem, who by the murderers were left weeping for their slain children, and would not be comforted because they were not. Matthew 2.18 A slip of the foot may soon be made, which will make a man go halting long after. As the fishes are taken in an evil net, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time. Ecclesiastes 9.12 The thing may fall out in a moment, under which the party shall go halting to the grave. 2. There is a crook made by a train of cross dispensations, whether of the same or different kinds, following hard one upon another, and leaving lasting effects behind them. Thus in the case of Job, while one messenger of evil tidings was yet speaking, another came. Job 1, 16-18 Cross events coming one upon the neck of another, 
deep calling unto deep make a sore crook. In that case the party is like unto one who, recovering his sliding foot from one unfirm piece of ground, sets it on another equally unfirm, which immediately gives way under him too. Or like unto one who, traveling in an unknown mountainous track, after having with difficulty made his way over one mountain, is expecting to see the plain country, but instead thereof there comes in view time after time a new mountain to be passed. This crook in Asaph's lot had like to have made him give up all his religion until he went into the sanctuary, where this mystery of providence was unriddled to him. Psalm 73, 13-17 Solomon observes, That there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Ecclesiastes 8, 14 Providence taking a run against them, as if they were to be run down for good and all. Whoever they be, whose life and no part thereof affords them experience of this. Sure Joseph missed not of it in his young days, nor Jacob in his middle days, nor Peter in his old days, nor our Saviour all his days. 3. There is a crook made by one cross dispensation, with lasting effects thereof coming in the room of another removed. Thus one crook straightened, there is another made in its place, and so there is still a crook. Want of children had long been the crook in Rachel's lot. Genesis 30, 1. That was at length made even to her mind, but then she got another in its stead, hard labor and travailing to bring forth. Chapter 35, 16. This world is a wilderness in which we may indeed get our station changed, but the remove will be out of one wilderness station to another. When one part of the lot is made even, soon some other part thereof will be crooked. More particularly, the crook in the lot hath in it four things of the nature of that which is crooked. 1. Disagreeableness. A crooked thing is wayward, and being laid to a rule, answers it not, but declines from it. There is not in anybody's lot any such thing as a crook in respect of the will and purposes of God. Take the most harsh and dismal dispensation in one's lot, and lay it to the eternal decree, made in the depth of infinite wisdom, before the world began, and it will answer it exactly, without the least deviation, all things being wrought after the counsel of His will. Ephesians 1, 11. Lay it to the providential will of God in the government of the world, and there is a perfect harmony. If Paul is to be bound at Jerusalem and delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, it is the will of the Lord it should be so. Acts 21, 11, 14. Wherefore, the greatest crook of the lot on earth is straight in heaven. There is no disagreeableness in it there. But in every person's lot there is a crook in respect of their mind and natural inclination. The adverse dispensation lies cross to that rule, and will by no means answer it, nor harmonize with it. When divine providence lays one to the other, there is a manifest disagreeableness. The man's will goes one way, and the dispensation another way. The will bends upwards, and cross events press down, so they are contrary. And there, and only there, lies the crook. It is this disagreeableness which makes the crook in the lot fit matter of trial and exercise to us, in this our state of probation in which, if thou wouldst approve thyself to God, walking by faith, not by sight, thou must quiet thyself in the will and purpose of God, and not insist that it should be according to thy mind. Job 34, 33. 2. Unsightliness. Crooked things are unpleasant to the eye, and no crook in the lot seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, making an unsightly appearance. Hebrews 12:11. Therefore men need to be aware of giving way to their thoughts, to dwell on the crook in their lot, and of keeping it too much in view. David shows a hurtful experience of this in that kind. Psalm 39, 3 While I was musing, the fire burned. Jacob acted a wiser part, calling his youngest son Benjamin, the son of the right hand, whom the dying mother had named Benoni, the son of my sorrow by this means providing that the crook in his lot should not be set afresh in his view on every occasion of mentioning the name of his son. Indeed, a Christian may safely take a steady and leisurely view of the crook of his lot in the light of the Holy Word, which represents it as the discipline of the covenant. 
so faith will discover a hidden sightliness in it under a very unsightly outward appearance, perceiving the suitableness thereof to the infinite goodness, love, and wisdom of God, and to the real and most valuable interests of the party, by which means one comes to take pleasure, and that a most refined pleasure in distresses. 2 Corinthians 12:10. But whatever the crook in the lot be to the eye of faith, it is not at all pleasant to the eye of sense. 3. Unfitness for motion. Solomon observes the cause of the uneasy and ungraceful walking of the lame. Proverbs 26, 7. The legs of the lame are not equal. This uneasiness they find, who are exercised about the crook in their lot, a high spirit and a low adverse lot, makes great difficulty in the Christian walk. There is nothing that gives temptation more easy access than the crook in the lot, nothing more apt to occasion out-of-the-way steps. Therefore, saith the Apostle, Hebrews 12:13, Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. They who are laboring under it are to be pitied then, and not to be rigidly censured, though they are rare persons who learn this lesson till taught by their own experience. It is long since Job made an observation in this case, which holds good unto this day. Job 12, 5. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. 4. Aptness to catch hold and entangle like hooks, fish hooks. Amos 4, 2. The crook in the lot doth so very readily make impression to the ruffling and fretting one spirit, irritating corruption, that Satan fails not to make diligent use of it for these dangerous purposes, which point once gained by the tempter, the tempted, ere he is aware, finds himself entangled as in a thicket out of which he knows not how to extricate himself. In that temptation it often proves like a crooked stick, troubling a standing pool which not only raises up the mud all over, but brings up from the bottom some very ugly thing. Thus it brought up a spice of blasphemy and atheism in Asaph's case. Psalm 73:13. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence, as if he had said, There is nothing at all in religion, it is a vain and empty thing that profiteth nothing. I was a fool to have been in care about purity and holiness, whether of heart or life. Ah, is this the pious Asaph? How is he turned so white unlike himself? But the crook in the lot is a handle, whereby the temper makes surprising discoveries of latent corruption, even in the best. This is the nature of the crook in the lot. Let us now observe what part of the lot it falls in. Three conclusions may be established upon this head. First, it may fall in any part of the lot, there is no exempted one in the case. For sin being found in every part, the crook may take place in any part. Being all as an unclean thing, we may all fade as a leaf. Isaiah 64, 6. The main stream of sin, which the crook readily follows, runs in very different channels in the case of different persons and in regard of the various dispensations of the minds of men, that will prove a sinking weight unto one which another would go very lightly under. Secondly, it may at once fall into many parts of the lot, the Lord calling, as in a solemn day, one's terrors round about. Lamentations 2.22 Sometimes God makes one notable crook in a man's lot, but its name may be Gad, being but the forerunner of a troop which cometh. Then the crooks are multiplied, so that the party is made to halt on each side. While one stream, let it from one quarter, is running full against him, another is let in on him from another quarter, till in the end the waters break in on every hand. Thirdly, it often falls in the tender part, I mean, that part of the lot wherein one is least able to bear it, or at least thinks he is so. Psalm 55, 12, 13. It was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it, but it was thou, a man, mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. If there is any one part of the lot which of all the others one is disposed to nestle in, the thorn will readily be laid there, especially if he belongs to God. In that thing wherein he is least of all able to be touched, he will be sure to be pressed. 
there the trial will be taken of him, for there is the grand competition with Christ. I take from them the desires of their eyes, and that whereupon they set their minds. Ezekiel twenty four twenty five. Since the crook and the lot is the special trial appointed for every one, it is altogether reasonable and becoming the wisdom of God that it fall on that which of all things doth most rival him. But more particularly, the crook may be observed to fall in these four parts of the lot. First, in the natural part affecting persons considered as of the make allotted for them by the great God that formed all things. The parents of mankind, Adam and Eve, were formed together sound and entire, without the least blemish, whether in soul or body. But in the formation of their posterity there often appears a notable variation from the original. Bodily defects, superfluities, deformities, infirmities, natural or accidental, made the crook in the lot of some. They have something unsightly or grievous about them. Crooks of this kind, more or less observable, are very common and ordinary. The best are not exempted from them, and it is purely owing to the sovereign pleasure that they are not more numerous. Tender eyes made the crook in the lot of Leah, Genesis 29:17. Rachel's beauty was balanced with barrenness, the crook in her lot, chapter 30, 1. Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles, was, it should seem, no personable man, but of a mean outward appearance, for which fools were apt to contemn him, 2 Corinthians 10:10. 10, 10. Timothy was of a weak and sickly frame, 1 Timothy 5:23, And there is a yet far more considerable crook in the lot of the lame, the blind, the deaf, and the dumb. Some are weak to a degree in their intellects, and it is the crook in the lot of several bright souls to be overcast with clouds, notably be misted and darkened from the crazy bodies they are lodged in, in the eminent instance whereof we have in the grave, wise, and patient Job, going mourning without the sun, yea, standing up and crying in the congregation. Job 30, 28. Secondly, it may fall in the honorary part. There is an honor due to all men, the small as well as the great, 1 Peter 2, 17, and that upon the ground of the original constitution of human nature, as it was framed in the image of God. But in the sovereign disposal of holy providence, the crook and the lot of some falls here. They are neglected and slighted. Their credit is still kept low. They go through the world under a cloud, being put into an ill name, their reputation sunk. This sometimes is the natural consequence of their own foolish and sinful conduct, as in the case of Dinah, who by her gadding abroad to satisfy her youthful curiosity regardless of, and therefore not waiting for a providential call, brought a lasting stain on her honor. Genesis 34 But where the Lord intends a crook of this kind in one's lot, innocence will not be able to ward it off in an ill-natured world. Neither will true merit be able to make head against it to make one's lot stand straight in that part. Thus David represents his case. Psalm 31, 11 through 13. They that did see me without fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many. Thirdly, it may fall on the vocational part. Whatever is a man's calling or station in the world, be it sacred or civil, the crook in their lot may take its place therein. Isaiah was an eminent prophet, but most unsuccessful. Isaiah 58, 1. Jeremiah met with such a train of discouragements and ill usage in the exercise of his sacred function that he was very near giving it up, saying, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah 20, 9. The psalmist observes this crook often to be made in the lot of some men very industrious in their civil business who sow in the fields. And at times, God blesseth them, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. But again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. Psalm 107, 37 through 39. Such a crook was even made in Job's lot after he had long stood even. Some manage their employments with all care and diligence, the husbandman carefully laboring his ground, the sheep master diligent to know the state of his flocks and looking well to his herds. 
the tradesman early and late at his business, the merchant diligently plying his, watching and falling in with the most fair and promising opportunities, but there is such a crook in that part of their lot, as all they are able to do can by no means make even. For why? The most proper means used for compassing an end are insignificant without a word of divine appointment commanding their success. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Lamentations 3.37 People ply their business with skill and industry, but the wind turns in their face. Providence crosses their enterprises, disconcerts their measures, frustrates their hopes and expectations, renders their endeavors unsuccessful, and so puts and keeps them still in straitened circumstances. So the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise. Ecclesiastes 9.11 Providence interposing crooks the measures which human prudence and industry had laid straight towards the respective ends. So the swift lose the race, and the strong the battle, and the wise miss of bread while, in the meantime, some one or other providential incident supplying the defect of human wisdom, conduct, and ability. The slow gain the race and carry the prize, the weak win the battle and enrich themselves with the spoil, and bread falls into the lap of the fool. Lastly, it may fall in the relational part. Relations are the joints of society, and there the crook and the lot may take place, one's smartest pain being often felt in these joints. They are in their nature the springs of man's comfort, yet they often turn the greatest bitterness to him. Sometimes this crook is occasioned by the loss of relations. Thus a crook was made in the lot of Jacob by means of the death of Rachel, his beloved wife, and the loss of Joseph, his son and darling, which had like to have made him go halting to the grave. Job laments this crook in his lot, Job 16:7. Thou hast made desolate all my company, meaning his dear children, every one of whom he had laid in the grave, not so much as one son or daughter left him. Again, sometimes it is made through the afflicting hand of God lying heavy on them, which in virtue of their relation recoils on the party as is feelingly expressed by that believing woman. Matthew 15:22. Have mercy on me, O Lord, my daughter is grievously vexed. Ephraim felt the smart of family afflictions, when he called his son's name Beriah, because it went evil with his house. 1 Chronicles 7.23 Since all is not only vanity, but vexation of spirit, it can hardly miss, but the more of these springs of comfort are open to a man, he must at one time or other find he is but the more sources of sorrow to gush out and spring in upon him. The sorrow always proportioned to the comfort found in them, or expected from them. And finally, the crook is sometimes made here by their proving uncomfortable through the disagreeableness of their temper and disposition. There was a crook in Job's lot by means of an undutiful, ill-natured wife. Job 19.17 In Abigail's by means of a surly, ill-tempered husband. 1 Samuel 25.25 25. In Eli's through the perverseness and obstinacy of his children. Chapter 2.25 in Jonathan's through the furious temper of his father, chapter 20, 30 through 33. So do men oftentimes find their greatest cross where they expected their greatest comfort. Sin hath unhinged the whole creation and made every relation susceptible of the crook. In the family are found masters hard and unjust, servants froward and unfaithful, in a neighborhood men selfish and uneasy, in the church ministers unedifying and offensive in their walk, and people contemptuous and disorderly, a burden to the spirits of ministers, in the state magistrates oppressive, and discountenancers of that which is good, and subjects turbulent and seditious. All these cause crooks in the lot of their relatives, and thus far of the crook itself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Bunn of Oak Ridge, Tennessee.